Hello, my name is Peter Sharoshi. Uh, I'm the director of the Rights Reporter Foundation and the uh, editor of the Drug Reporter website. And um, I'm hosting this discussion on global cannabis policies here at the UN headquarters in Vienna, where the 62nd uh, session of the Commission on Narcotic Drugs is taking place a few meters actually from us. And um, uh, governments are discussing, debating uh, global drug policies right now. This is the uh, largest uh, decision-making forum in, in, in the world. And um, uh, I have excellent guest speakers with me today here. Uh, we have Lisa Maria Sanchez from Mexico City, uh, representing Mexicans Against uh, Crime, Mexicans United Against Crime and Transform. Uh, we have uh, Martin Yelsma. Uh, from the Transnational Institute, and Michael Kravitz uh, from the United States, representing veterans uh, for uh, medical cannabis success. And um, just 60 years ago, uh, uh, cannabis was uh, played by the United Nations on the Schedule 4 of the uh, UN, UN Drug Conventions, and uh, this is the same list as, the, uh, as heroin or cocaine, you know, substances highly addictive and with no recognized medical value. And um, uh, last year, uh, uh, the, the WHO made the first scientific review ever on uh, cannabis. And as a result, it uh, made a proposal to the UN to reschedule uh, cannabis to, uh, uh, to schedule one, uh, which means that it will be recognized as a, as a, as a medicine. And uh, this is clearly a historical decision. Uh, although we can discuss, you know, how significant and what what are the implications of that uh, in the world drug policies, we know that uh, the world is now progressing in big steps uh, to uh, making cannabis legal. There are more than 30 countries in the world that uh, made medic medical use of cannabis legal. There are several countries now uh, making cannabis uh, uh, the recreational use of cannabis uh, legal. Uh, but let's first look a bit back, back to the past. So I, I'm, I'm looking to you, Martin, because you are one of the best experts on the history of the international drug control system. How cannabis ended up on, on Schedule 4 in the first place, like 60 years ago? Can you tell us the story of, uh, of why and how cannabis uh, became uh, 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 this uh, prohibited substance on the UN uh, uh, conventions? Thanks. Um, and yes, I, I would love to talk about that for <laughs> an hour. <laughs> it's a fascinating history. But um, in, in short, no, it, cannabis came, first came to the international drug policy discussions uh, already in 1925. Uh, and, and some cannabis preparations were already included in the 25 convention. So when um, after the Second World War, now, when they started to negotiate the single convention, 1961 single convention, yeah, the, the, the first step was, was basically to, um, to, to take as a starting point the substances that were already under control. So uh, cannabis was part of the discussion immediately, but still uh, there, there was some promise to um, still have a good review before just copy-paste the existing uh, lists from before the Second World War into the single convention. That never happened. No, the, the WHO expert committee is, is the entity that, that has the mandate to recommend to, to the C&D, to this commission here, um, on scheduling decisions, so what, which substance has to be scheduled at what level under international control. Um, at, at the time, in the 50s, um, yeah, the, 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 uh, the WHO never got to do a critical review. There, there was a, a very strongly anti-cannabis uh, activist secretary of the expert committee at that time. Um, and, and he wrote several, yeah, really things that, that are more pamphlets, I would say. No, the, 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 by no means uh, anywhere near, near scientific standards of today. Uh, including also racist and 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 yeah, uh, colonial cultural insensitive uh, arguments. So based on those pamphlets, basically, the WHO expert committee 
Yeah, Rick said, recommended that indeed it should be, uh, that, that it wouldn't have any medical use and that it should be included in Schedule 4, but also in Schedule 1, which, which I think is also a serious problem. Uh, yeah, so th that's how it happened. In the earlier drafts of the single convention, uh, th there was a special uh, paragraph even uh, that cannabis would be the only substance that would be fully prohibited. Um, and and that, that means, in terms of the treaties, also prohibited for medical use. So that it would only only be used for scientific research, basically, but, but nothing else. That didn't make it. Uh, it did end up in Schedule 4, which, which uh, indeed is for substances they thought at the time had little therapeutic value and were highly addictive. That, that was sort of the category. Um, yeah, uh, but but in the negotiations there was already it, it was not obligatory um, to uh, impose the full prohibition, including on medical uses. So countries already had the option, as many countries have done, to also allow medical use uh, if they wanted. Could you speak? If I could ask a question for a minute. Yeah. yeah, so at, at the time of the negotiations of the single convention, the, the, um, the, the cannabinoids were, were not really, uh, they were sort of busy at the time of, of um, discovering them, no? but they had not been isolated. And, but shortly after that, uh, that, that did happen. So... And that was at the time that they started to negotiate the next treaty, the 71 treaty. And of course there was a decision uh, or discussion, you know, should they be then be part of, just added to the single convention, the THC, Delta 9 THC, Dronabinol. Um, and and it, was, it was basically because of uh, the pharmaceutical industry who were at that moment starting to develop some medicines based on uh, the renabinol. Um, uh, and, and that was also for some other medicines that the pharmaceutical industry was developing for other substances, that there was pressure to, to keep it separate in another treaty with a lighter regime. And, and it, it's a controversial uh, decision at the time, mainly under pressure of the pharmaceutical industry, without a scientific justification, I would say and something that now the, the expert committee is addressing again because they now propose to um, yeah, to transfer THC Dramel back to the 61 convention. Mm -hmm. So we know that this decision does not, did not come out of the blue, but several professionals and activists have been working hard for several years to, uh, you know, to, to, to kind of... Uh, pressurize the system to, to recognize the medical value of, 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 of this uh, substance and you are one of them. Michael, can you talk us uh, about the, the process that led to this uh, pro current proposal and, and your personal uh, uh, involvement and work uh, around this issue? Sure. Um, so I, I'm trying to think of where to pick up. It goes back for me uh, quite a ways. The process itself that we're seeing the result of right now was a process that was started uh, in the vast majority of it uh, was, was started by a resolution that was passed here at the Commission on Narcotic Drugs. I think it was 2009, uh, the so-called seed resolution, cannabis seed resolution. And that was Japan and Azerbaijan that put in a resolution. Uh, Japan, I remember very clearly the complaints from the floor that they were making about their young people buying cannabis seeds on the internet and, and how that was a, a big problem and they wanted some kind of control. I'm pretty sure, in fact, I'm, I'm absolutely sure that they had no idea how big a rabbit hole they were getting into by asking this, this of, of the system itself, because seeds are exempt under the treaty, for one, but also, too, that to add cannabis seeds, since it's not ran in, would be an actual big lift. It's not a small thing they were asking uh, the, the process to do by adding cannabis seeds. So uh, that was, I guess, interpreted or translated into a request for a official review of cannabis or assessment of cannabis by the World Health Organization, which then was seconded, I believe, by the International Narcotics Control Board. So there was quite a, a few uh, distinct 
requests. In the interim, the, there was a fellow that I got to meet through my medical marijuana work. At the time, he was running the medical marijuana program of the Netherlands for the government, uh, William Schulten. And uh, William uh, was on the expert committee. He was a, the, uh, they didn't have an expert committee meeting during his time. And that's the problem. They had, didn't have those expert committee meetings for a very long time, as I understand it. And he was trying to uh, see how he can get this process started. He had a whole list of substances that were just like cannabis, like coca, that were put into the treaty in antiquity based on information that was either false, misinformation, or just lacking evidence. And that all should be revisited. I think he came up with like 24 plant mostly plant-based substances that are, are in the treaty but have never had an evidentiary review. And cannabis was leading that pack. And I remember sitting at one of these tables just like this and, and just he and I brainstorming how we could get this started. To get a process like the expert committee started, we figured would take either, we couldn't do it just from like if George Soros wanted to give me money to do it. I couldn't do it, even though I could ask George Soros for that and, and he'd probably do it. We couldn't do it that way. Even if it was individual funders, it would have to be a group uh, representing like the Red Cross or something like that, and if we got, you got countries, it couldn't be just our friends. It couldn't just ask you know Uruguay to, to to cover it. It would have to be a group of countries, and especially probably maybe countries like Canada or the UK or Germany or something like that leading the pack. Uh, again, to to try to uh, have some kind of uh, middle ground, uh, a, a balance, a consensus kind of approach to, to get these guys to do stuff um, at that level. So anyway, um, the WHO uh, expert committee finally was brought together after William left. And I, I went and spoke to the committee, spoke with Steph Shear on the importance of doing a review of, of cannabis, uh, not just an update. At that time, they were going to do just an update of cannabis. Um, there was a, a, a person on the committee uh, expert committee member, I guess they're 13 or 11, 11, 12, 13, varies from time to time. They are all real experts, and this uh, woman, certainly a, a great expert, but she's anti-marijuana as can be, a professor, Bertha Madras. So one of the first things I did was spoke to the importance of doing a review and the importance of the expert committee assessing whether Bertha Madras, Professor Madras, uh, was an appropriate member of the committee. I, I felt like I had to do this because she was so effective at an anti-marijuana activist that she could actually make a sensible argument by me look ridiculous once they left my, my site. So the next time they met, uh, they did just agree to do a review, and they uh, didn't have Professor Madras on the committee. Even after that, though, um, there were steps along the way where it just the, the process just tries to stall. I think the the placement of cannabis it's kind of a weird catch-22 where no one has the courage to step up and change it. I guess that's where Jack Harry came up with his emperor wears no clothes, because everyone can see it needs to be changed. But who has the courage to really step up and do that? And uh, the WHO has now finally accepted that responsibility completely. Uh, it took a lot of work by a lot of people. I think at any given point, we had a, as many as 100 people working with us. We've submitted documents like our civil society uh, documentation that I showed you that had 60 people contribute and over 200 NGOs sign on. Uh, our core team, uh, Kenzie, uh, Ribulet, me, Farid, uh, Gaushe, um, with others extending out to maybe 15 or 20 in our core team, have attended all the meetings in Geneva and presented evidence. And we've had 10 and 20, even 30 people in that little tiny room in Geneva at the World Health Organization headquarters speaking from the heart, speaking from science, and, and no anti-marijuana voice to be heard really, to be found. And I, I think that doesn't speak to the ineffectiveness of anti-marijuana. I think that speaks to the fact that we were working on something very real there. It was based on real evidence, and we didn't have really time for talking points or, you know, ideological positions. So, can you explain us what is in this proposal of the, uh, of the ECDD, which was uh, adopted last year in November? What does it say, and what, what its significance is? Yeah, I, I would say uh, the, the the critical review uh, documentation itself. No, the, the, they they had five different substance uh, cannabis related uh, substances under review. Th those are very thorough um, literature literature review documents. No, there, there's a lot of excellent information in there. I, th I think they they will be uh, an important reference um, for for the next years to come. However. Um, I think that the, the 
conclusions that in the end were drawn in terms of the concrete scheduling recommendations, that, th that there is in fact a disconnect between the evidence they present and the conclusions that are drawn that, are, in my view, are, are politically influenced. So what, what I do propose is um, to take cannabis and cannabis raisin out of Schedule 4, which indeed is a certain recognition of, of their medical value, you know, and, and that's basically acknowledging the reality that, that, that indeed there are by now 40 countries who, who, who are um, implementing uh, medical cannabis programs. So it's a recognition of, of reality, but also based on the critical review. You know, there, there's a, a many scientific documents are quoted that, that uh, prove that there is medical um, therapeutic value in, in cannabis related, uh, uh, all kinds of cannabis substances. So then the, the problematic thing, one of the problematic thing is that they then recommend that it should remain in Schedule 1. And, and that's where I think problems are, are uh, starting to arise because for, for that in their scheduling procedure, no, they, they have to do this, a similarity test. So whether it is, uh, has similar ill effects and similar risk of addiction in terms of the, the, the treaty as other substances already in the schedule. Um, so, and b because they do have a historical responsibility for the fact that it is included in Schedule 1, which, which, which is together with morphine, with heroin, with, with cocaine, no, it, it is a very strictly controlled schedule. Um, so th they, in the critical review report, they conclude that it does not have similar harmful effects as many of the other substances on Schedule 1, but they still recommend to, main, to keep it on that list because it is so widely abused in the world, which is not a criterion at all. And yeah, and, and yeah, you have to remember you now that when these two meetings took place of the from the, 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 the expert committee in, in June and November last year, the, the the political the polarization about the cannabis issue here in Vienna was at a boiling point. You know? Canada had just decided you know, in May to, to go for full regulation. The, the, the Russian Federation here, but also the ICB uh, Secretariat, were aggressively uh, yeah, campaigning against Canada, but uh, on the cannabis issue uh, yeah, more in general. So it, it is in that political context that the WHO had to make a choice. They, they clearly wanted to give a sign medical use should be um, recognized, but they definitely, uh, they, were, they, they erred on the side of caution, let's say it politely, uh, that th their recommendations would not throw any fuel to the, to the political fire about cannabis regulation more generally. But with that, I, I think they failed to sort of correct the historical error that they are co-responsible for. And, and that is a serious issue because if, if it is approved as it is, no, of course there, there still has to be a, a voting procedure coming up, but it, it then will, for the first time in history, no, justify, ratify the inclusion of cannabis on Schedule 1, supposedly based on, on a thorough, scientific, critical review exercise of the WHO. I find that problematic. You know. there, there are yeah, some other details about uh, the, 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 the recommendations. What I would add to that is, uh, well, first of all, kind of to maybe defend the WHO slightly, um, I think it's totally justifiable to say they've acted politically, to agree with Martin. But 
I don't think they would say they've acted politically. And I think the nuance of that would be that they've tried desperately to avoid controversy. And they want their recommendations to be accepted. Desperately want to not have controversy, desperately want to not create controversy of not being able to have a successful vote. And, and somehow, you gotta realize that the WHO process, as uh, Martin talked about, they do so much work all the time, adding new drug substances and things that the commission is poorly qualified, if, if even competent, to do it all. The, the CND really does count on the WHO in this process, and I think it's like a doctor making this devil's arithmetic for medical marijuana even, where, you know, do I want to treat these handful of patients that have this specific medical need if they uh, threaten, my <laughs> threaten my ability to treat the 3,000 other patients I have in my practice? And that's a real choice that these patients get denied access under in, in my world, the work that I do. So anyway, it gives the medical side of that, you know, where the devil's arithmetic of, you know, do I go as far as we really should go? They said themselves that cannabis shouldn't be in Schedule 1. And, and, but again, maybe to take it one step further, the, the Schedule 1 placement also has coca leaf, it also has poppy flower. These things clearly don't belong in Schedule 1 either. So uh, while it has heroin and it has cocaine as well, that may arguably belong in Schedule 1, even though they're from that plant material. I think the plant material, all of it, needs to be removed from Schedule 1. So I'm thinking maybe this is, you know, team effort here. The World Health Organization goes as far as they can. They do what they can. They, they certainly have registered themselves, and we're registering. I think Martin is doing the best job of registering our perspective of why that's not sufficient. but. It is something that can pass. It's passable here. It's votable. And I, I, for one, am on the side that thinks this vote can actually succeed and we can actually change the treaty here. That's no small thing. That's a monumental thing. So if we can do that, I think we should be coming back, and this is the first time Martin's hearing this from me, but I think we should come back very soon with resolutions on the table from some of these countries, uh, that are Bolivia, that are Uruguay, that are Canada, uh, with, with uh, hard you know, data, facts, good reports, and, and, a, and a very sound presentation to pull all the plant material out of Schedule 1 and do something with it. There, I, I hand it back to him because I don't know what to do with it, but it needs clearly to, to be out of Schedule 1. The, the tinctures, extracts, and things, the way the WHO explained it, uh, concoctions that the active ingredient can't be so easily removed from, therefore theoretically less abusable, are going to be put in Schedule 3 of the single convention, and that's a very low placement that should allow concoctions, cannabis concoctions that are uh, registrable at the national level um, to be, you know, very, very easily accessible by patients, hopefully more insurance coverage, you know, stuff like that. So that's kind of what we're excited about. That's an interesting debate. Maybe we can get back to it uh, a bit later. But uh, when we are speaking about the historical error which the UN made by uh, uh, making cannabis illegal, I think there is well, maybe the, the the region that suffered more, more the most of of this uh, the, of the impact or the effects of this decision of this historical error is Latin America, and uh, when I'm here at the United Nations, I always try to ask people, you know, like, what is the real on the ground impact of of those resolutions and uh, and decisions and proposals of the WHO and all these documents? What 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 real impact they have on the ground on in the country level and uh, also, I would like to ask you, Lisa, uh, what role uh, Latin America is playing now in this, in, this, in this debate at the UN level? Can you maybe talk about that? Yeah, sure. But let me just start with a quick comment. Um, we started all this conversation by saying that there is an expert committee that was conducting a scientific review. Um, and if we take um, for valid the results of the scientific review, uh, we're agreeing on a political um, review of what's the most possible viable alternative, um, the current state being what the current state is, having an extremely polarized ambience in which there are countries that still punish cannabis possession with the death penalty, and then you have other countries that went for, few, for full regulation. So it's not a scientific thing if we're not accepting what science says, uh, but it's a rather political commitment to just like allow what's the, what causes the least harm to the system and not necessarily what improves reality to its best. So 
that said, um, Latin America is definitely the region that has been fueling drug policy reform in regards to cannabis. Is the hemisphere that has the most territories already implementing some sort of regulation for medical and scientific use, but also it's the region that has all of the full regulatory experiences uh, with Canada and Uruguay. Um, other than all the jurisdictions, I know Marty is giving me the eye because uh, the Netherlands started first. <laughs> I'm just kidding, uh, but but they didn't go for the entire, you know, regulating the entire chain, right? Um, so it's definitely where the the political advances are more plausible. It's where you can actually see advance in the ground, and as basically as you said, south of the border of the United States, it's basically where the war on drugs has has been fought with the most uh, vigor, I would say. It's where we have some of the most punitive policies, not to say the most, because Southeast Asia is definitely uh, way ahead of us. Uh, but we've suffered the social and economic consequences of having to prohibit these markets and having to fight for these drugs not to get into the consumer markets, uh, specifically into the US or, U or the other European um, countries. But what's going to happen in the ground, as we already move forward to trying to regulate some of the uses of these plant and its derivatives and its um, the cannabinoids that are present in the plant and other substances present in the plant, is that um, if we actually vote for these recommendations to materialize, and this is not to say that I tr I'm preventing drug policy reform, not at all, but if we vote this, most of the medical regimes in Latin America will suffer. Um, and, and this is because of a very technical stuff that the rec one of the recommendations says that um, medicinal products or derivatives used for medical purposes should only have under 0 0.2 point, under 0 0.2 percent of THC um, if they're to be considered medicines, right? And in many countries like mine, for example, I come from Mexico, where in 2017 the parliament voted a bill that allowed for medicinal and scientific use of cannabis. Um, there is a distinction already, a legal distinction of what constitutes medicine and what constitutes therapeutic preparations that will help you with symptoms but are not necessarily um, considered medicines or treatment. Uh, the distinction is 1% THC. So if you adopt this new resolution and you actually mandate this as a treaty obligation, countries like mine will be forced or at least encouraged to change the regulatory systems already in place as to restrict even more the access of patients to substances that have little more THC uh, than the quantity allowed by this new recommendation. And this is, o this is also the case for other countries in, in, in the hemisphere that already have regulatory regimes. This is the case for Uruguay, this is the case for Jamaica, this is the case for Chile, this is the case even from Brazil. That is a country that now has a very conservative regime, but that allows for the importing of different medicinal, therapeutic, pharmaceutical products that have over 1% THC, so they can be used uh, by the patients. We as an organization in Mexico are defending some cases uh, and, and actually taking those cases to the Supreme Court and this is how we got jurisprudence for recreational use or adult use of cannabis uh, this year, like three weeks ago. We basically got the, the jurisprudence on February the 22nd, 2019. Um, we're defending some other patients um, for, that use cannabis for medicinal purposes and one of these kids, it's an eight-year-old boy that develops resistance to medicines to treat his epilepsy, but that he also develops resistance to cannabinoids. So for him, for example, and I know this is a tiny minority of patients, but they still have the right to access to health, and they still have the right to access to the best possible medication that can treat 
uh, their symptoms or their illness. And this particular kid is not going to have access to the variety of substances in, and the ratios of cannabinoids present in the plant that he actually needs in order to remain stable. His mother needs to change um, you know, the, the types of plant, but also the types of concentration and modulates um, his medicine for him to remain stable and not having more epileptic crisis. So when we're thinking about establishing just like very arbitrary um, limits to something because it's the, it's the most reachable or it's the only possible agreement that we can have given the political ambience or arena, we're actually not committing to the science of it, but we're also not thinking about the impacts on the ground. And this is going to harm many of the medicinal systems that are already in place and, and somehow try to be as limited and as, as um, discreet as possible given the political conditions here in Vienna, New York and, and Geneva. So we, we have to think about that and we have to think about that using science as evidence because that was the original mandate. The, we didn't talk about CBD um, and CBD is something that uh, has been kind of a, it's interesting from the United States perspective because in the United States we separated the marijuana movement into the marijuana and hemp movement a long, long time ago because we recognized that the issues surrounding the use of cannabis, hemp, for uh, fiber, for fuel, for food, they really didn't have any of the sociological issues of our kind of uh, uh, hippie generation, you know, ethic of the marijuana movement. It was more about farming and industrial applications and suit and tie kind of stuff. So we, did, we literally did that, where we didn't talk about marijuana anymore and we talked about hemp, we didn't talk about hemp anymore, separated. But that, is, that separation is going away now because of CBD. And CBD is now uh, out there everywhere as a byproduct of hemp. But that's industrial application hemp that's now, you know, they're gearing towards producing CBD. And that out in the market is really, uh, it's a buyer's beware market. Some of the stuff has been found to not have any CBD in it. Some of it has been found to have all kinds of other stuff. And the police say it's got any trace of THC in it. Oh, it's marijuana. Then all of a sudden it's marijuana because there's no clarification in the treaty that CBD is not in the treaty. So that was really the, the, the task at hand for the WHO is figure out how do we say in the treaty that CBD is not in the treaty. And the way they decided to do that was put a note in the treaty. Now, <laughs> there is the number in that note. It's 0.2%. But I think you'll find uh, a, a real relief to hear that doesn't apply, and Martin can correct me, but that doesn't apply to anything else, just to CBD. So it's in that note. And this, I, I think, would also lend very well to the argument the WHO would make about how it's nice to have a little more time for countries to, usually they'd only have a few months to, to talk, about, talk about this. Now they're having a whole year because of their delay, which furiated us to no end. But it actually seems to be useful for the time that it's going to take to really sort out what this means. So what they're going to do is they're uh, planning to put a note in the treaty, literally a note on the margins, that says that CVD is not in the treaty. But the proviso is the line in the sand. It has to have less than 2.2% THC in it to be considered pure CBD under the treaty, which is a relief to those who are actually producing CBD because now, in some places, it's zero. You've got to have pure you know, distillate uh, CBD, which is mostly not even from plant material, that they're actually calling you know, pure CBD out in the marketplace. So having 0.2%, even though it's uh, arguably, and this is where I would agree, not a number we should adopt, and it's just... Everything you said about the number is true, but it doesn't, I don't think it applies to re rosin, hashish, but, but cannabis. THC is going to live but, uh, THC, and that's what I've got a question for Martin, too. I, again, uh, is, that, uh, is that an increase? It was like Schedule 2 in the 71 convention, a Schedule 1 in the single convention. Is that an increase, a decrease, or a, like a cross the board move? Yeah, well, I think those are all things that, that uh, do um, justify a postponement of the vote yes. <laughs> because I, I was I was actually pleased that that uh, well they still have to formally decide it next week but but it, it indeed it will be uh, postponed either December or or March next year and yeah and and there are so many question marks about these issues that that require more clarification now and, and of course if you have um, yeah a, a strict interpretation no, at, at the moment, there is no threshold no, of, of, of yeah. THC content. So, in, th in principle, a strict interpretation is that 
ever any presence of THC you know, would makes it basically yeah, a product that falls under Schedule 1. So in, in that sense, it, it is a little bit higher, but it, it also fixes it, because the fact that there was no threshold also gave some flexibility you know, to countries, because the, the, indeed there are countries that have already introduced other thresholds. So, if, indeed, it, it, it primarily applies to, to define CBD products, but I, I agree that it, it perpetuates uh, uh, yeah, it perpetuates a whole uh, yeah, a lot of questions about uh, sc uh, national schedules that, that have other thresholds already in place. And, and I think that's combined with the, the confusion that, that they also give for how they define the exempted preparations in Schedule 3. Because uh, they talk about, yeah, the, the, uh, it, it has to be difficult to uh, extract, the, the, yeah, but it's also, that's not clearly defined. And, and then they talk about pharmaceutical preparations. No, and what, what worries me is that it's a similar language that, that appears in the INCB report, which yeah. just released a special chapter on, on uh, medical cannabis, no, where, where they consequently put medical cannabis in quotation marks and then uh, yeah, seem to indicate that on, in their interpretation only pharmaceutical preparations with cannabinoids are accepted uh, for medical use under the treaties. So that, that excludes yeah, a whole range of more natural products, no, but it also, and, and, and it's often, it's defended by sort of uh, the rights of patients, they have to have good controlled Those medicines, and etc. But at the same time, no, there's also the rights of patients who, who do not have any access to medicines once it is scheduled as uh, a, a, a pharmaceutical industry patented product uh, by uh, the, the Western uh, pharmaceutical industry. And, and the treaties have allowed a certain flexibility for uh, traditional can medical cannabis use in India, China, for example. No, that, is, that is mentioned. And now both the ICP and, in fact, the, the WHO Expert Committee yeah, sort of say, no, all those natural products, the, the cannabis uh, itself as a medicine, that is, should all not be... That, that's basically the message that they're giving. Only f pharmaceutical preparations patented by the pharmaceutical industry, gone through all the tests, etc., should be allowed on, on the market. I don't, I don't think that is uh, su sufficient... No, just, just a tiny precision, because it goes a little beyond that, because you already have that first limit that it's the interpretation of medical cannabis only being a pharmaceutical product, and that has the price issue and the access issue and who produces this and who imports it and who exports it and, and all that kind of thing that we have with regular medicines, and it's already very contentious about how, how many people do effectively have access to these medicines in lower income countries, for example. Um, and then, um, but then there's another level of difficulty that happens, for example, with existing regulatory models, such as the Colombian one. If you go just for the threshold of what constitutes, uh, what constitutes pure CBD and you respect the 0.2%, um, then you fall into a different regulatory uh, framework that will give physicians different requirements and obligations towards national law to issue prescriptions for those medicines and to control the availability of the product to the final user. And this equals, for example, a, a prescription of a cannabis-based product with 0.3% THC, let's just say, to a, to a prescription of morphine. It will have effectively the same controls, at least in regulatory models in Latin America, like the Colombian one, as, as we already know that that's the limit in Colombian law. And effectively, 
um, neglects or makes even more difficult for patients to access to these substances that are already have a legal market and a legal use. Um, this is what happens. People coming from middle income or low income country already know that regardless of the existence of a legal market for opiates or morphine in specific, there's many, many countries that don't have access to that because of the price and because of the restrictions, the bureaucratic obligations that a state has to fulfill in order to uh, prove control of these particular substance under the international obligations they subscribed. So giving that, it's not only that you're authorizing de facto just pharmaceutical products, but even within the pharmaceutical products, you're making comparable the prescriptions of a fairly safe product that's harmless and has no psychoactive effect to a product that has a much more addictive ratio or consequences or, or whatever, which again takes us back to the fact that this is not based on science because you cannot have the same requisites uh, for two com non-comparable substances and uses. So, it's like many, many countries are struggling, you know, to uh, stay beyond the boundaries of this international drug control conventions. And I know that TNI has a kind of proposal uh, on uh, uh, how to kind of elegant, in an elegant way, how to uh, go beyond the conventions, but still keep the spirit and letter of the conventions. Can you uh, explain us what is this solution you're proposing? Yeah, it's basically, um, st for the starting point is that uh, the, uh, the last five years, you know, the policy developments have developed incredibly rapidly. Now, it, it, it has polarized the debate here in Vienna. It, it's clear that the solution will not be found here by negotiating whatever. <laughs> no, the, it, every time they, they discuss it now, uh, it, it ends in yeah, almost <laughs> close to a physical fight. No? I mean, I've, I've been following the, the CND, coming to the CND for, for more than 20 years. I have never before seen that, that level of aggressive statements. So, yeah, you, ca you can forget that through a negotiated process, you, you can somehow open more space for countries to continue in the direction of legal regulation of the cannabis market. What now becomes clear is that also the a WHO proposal um, to have a scientific review, rethink of the classification is also not going to work, no? because there's already self-censorship that they basically only want to look at certain restricted medical uh, uses and, and they don't want to m mess in the more political debate about yeah, so so that is also not not a way out. No, even if they would have recommended to take it fully out of of the schedules, it would not have survived the vote here in the CND. So well, th that's true. But but at least then other countries would have the the argument of a scientific backing of of the WHO. So I, I still think that would have been preferable. So, but starting from that point, uh, we, 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 yeah, with a group of international lawyers, we started to think, so then what can countries do that, uh, for, for very good reasons, do not want to violate international law? You know, international law is, is, yeah, is, is a very valuable um, thing. It is under pressure politically on many issues at the moment. Yeah, but we think it is important to, to be careful about uh, international law. So, and, and it is clear that legal regulation violates certain uh, provisions of the, of the treaties. We've always been clear about that, yeah, and that Canada now also acknowledges it. No, that the, indeed, that they are in um, violation of, of certain treaty provisions. So, then what could be the answer? So, th there's one option that is uh, embedded in the... Uh, the Vienna Treaty on Treaties, um, and that is, was designed at the time specifically for treaty regimes that are, that are more or less frozen in time. 
that it is, it's basically impossible to, to find a consensus again to amend the treaty. Or, uh, and so then they, they came up with this figure of inter se modification, that if it is too difficult to, to change the treaty as a whole, and to prevent that when it comes to that, countries just start to withdraw from the treaties, there is, under specific circumstances, restrictions, the possibility for a group of like-minded countries to agree a sort of a sub-treaty and to modify certain provisions of the, the treaty with effect among themselves alone. And then that group still still promises, you know, still remains party of the big treaty and still will comply with the, the, the obligations towards the other treaty parties that are not, uh, that have not signed the, the inter se agreement among the like-minded countries. So th that is now, there's now, uh, conversations are starting about it. Uh, with the international treaty lawyers, we, yeah, we, have, we have spelled out that we think it is, this is a situation where this, this model could be um, applicable and, and justified. Um, and, and so, yeah, we hope that those countries who, who, who already have regulated or the ones who are considering to go in that direction, because I think the next five years, yeah, those policy trends will continue. Yeah, those can, can start to think about a, a sub-agreement among themselves, which then also would allow um, international trade between legally regulated markets. And that's another thing that's for us important, you know, because if countries like, like the Netherlands and, and Canada, if they only uh, adopt nationally closed, domestically closed systems, what, what we will see over the next years is that gradually all the traditional farmers from the traditional producing countries in the south will be pushed out of the list market. So, w so we, we do think that there should be a place also for small farmers in, in traditional cr producing countries to stay, uh, to, to keep a slot, uh, keep yeah, supplying the international, the opening spaces in the, in the licit cannabis market. And, and that, would also, that then would be allowed if that kind of inter se treaty um, could, could be negotiated. So we don't have much time left, so the, the question I want to ask you from all of you is about the future. How do you see the future? We have many fears and hopes about the future. Many people fear that you know there will be a kind of big marijuana, big, big companies will take over the market. As Martin, you say that some countries can be pushed out from the market. And so what could we do to prevent that kind of things? And, and what would be the optimal uh, regulation for the world? What, what is your vision of, of, of the future of the cannabis market? Let's start. With. So um, I, I, it fits per perfectly in responding to what Martin was saying anyway for me. I, I think that most, if not all, I, I, I come to these meetings and I go to the WHO with a mandate of speaking for the cannabis movement as a whole because uh, there's no one else doing it, essentially. Um, varied from time to time, we'll ask questions to the plenary floor and stuff from here. Uh, we're a very, very small group that are really actually willing to take that step and actually speak for the cannabis culture in these proceedings. And we have kind of, there's two sets of, of thought, like do we work incrementally or do we want to you know, go for a, a very, very uh, big ask and negotiate and just try to get there? I would argue that what Martin's saying is the big ask is more important. Uh, I would argue that what he's saying is that we should get it right and have a model and work towards that. And, and not have you know steps in the way, the, the, what you could call the WHO's position, an incremental step. Um, making it maybe a simple model to look at, like in the United States, we have the scheduling one, two, three, four, and cannabis is a schedule one, which means it can't use it at all as medicine. And uh, when we started the marijuana movement, uh, medical marijuana movement in the U.S., Bob Randall was asking for schedule two. We wouldn't accept, accept schedule two now. We as a movement in the United States recognize that schedule two would actually be more problematic for us. Think about that. It's absolutely prohibited, felony possession, but yet we're more comfortable with that system 
then we are moving and out of that system into a controlled medicine because we realize that system is so screwed up, it's even worse for us. That's mind-boggling. Think about it. And, and think about it from the perspective of someone in prison for 30 years for possession under that incredibly prohibitive regime of Schedule 1. But it is unworkable with Schedule 2. It's, I recognize that and I don't work for that. But I do work for an incremental step towards where we're going, towards where you have sustainability. We handed out, I'll plug this document at the CND this year, uh, Cannabis Sustainability. And you see how big it is. We've always prided ourselves in, in working from an environmental perspective, from a human rights perspective, from a medicinal access perspective. So when they start talking about sustainability, we're talking about local growth. We're talking about craft farmers. We're talking about things that are sustainable, environmentally friendly, and, 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 and promote equality and, and all these things that get us away from the colonialism that of, these, of these laws. These are like the laws that they, they, they manifestly, you know, it, implement legal colonialism. And, and what she's saying, if I would take Lisa's word and, and paraphrase it, is we don't want a, a new colonialism replacing the old colonialism. So that's where we're at. And how do we do that? How do we get from, from here to there incrementally is a mind-boggling difficulty. And in the United States, there's very few people that have any plan. We had a, a, a delegate in the Senate that put forward a, a proposal to create an alcohol, tobacco, firearms, and cannabis and just pull it out of the Controlled Substances Act. I mean, the, the, these things get really mind-boggling uh, to try to think about how we would do that, how we would actually have a new system, how do we get from here to there. So that's all I would put out as an open question. You know, I, I agree with your premise, I agree with your thoughts, but how do we get from here to there? I'm a here to there guy. And I, I work incrementally to build a lot of the structures we're standing on here. The New York NGO Committee, that's me. I, I, I did it at one point. It was just one guy in New York doing it. That was me. And now it's this huge thing that is so powerful and so beautiful. And, and together with Vienna, NGO Committee has created a civil society task force that looks eye to eye. We had, at the, before the African groups and the, and the G8s and, the, and the whatever spoke, we had the NGO Committee speaking on behalf of the civil society task force. That's coming a long way incrementally. I, I, I just need a path. And I don't want to step on a landmine, you know, to use my military background. <laughs> So that's me. <laughs> I see things change happening, basically. Um, in 2013, Martin and I uh, were part of this group that for the Organization of American States, or regional organization in the Americas, wrote a report. And there was a scenario that was called Pathways in which we basically foresee uh, cannabis legalization happening all across the Americas from 2013 to 2025 and that's basically happening, right? So you basically have now some 70% some of the continent already exploring some sort of regulation. So I see change happening and I see change happening on the ground. So I see reform happening from the bottom to the top and not the other way around. Uh, what I don't see, and I think it's a missing conversation that we should be having right now, is a full acknowledgement of the existence of the cannabis industry already, yeah. shaping those regulations and shaping uh, the possibilities of such reform movement happening on the ground. And I don't see a conversation about corporate integrity. Because these guys are going to make money. These guys are already making a lot of money. Um, and they're not necessarily thinking about the social consequences, the economic consequences, the institutional consequences, for example, in a country like mine, where the rule of law doesn't necessarily exist because corruption has been fueled for decades with drug money, with illicit drugs money. Um, so we should think about how to involve these new players, how to make them think socially and under this integrity lens of what the impact of their actions can be on the ground and how to actually make a regulatory system that works for everybody and that allows for, for effective exercise of human rights. I, I'd say that, and I think it's a full responsibility and commitment of civil society members like us to push for that change and to push for that to happen. So I, I, I definitely think change is going to happen. Change requires the integration of these new players from an integrity perspective, um, but it's also going to happen uh, with us in, in our terms if we decide to participate, because this is what's been happening around here, right? Yep. Yeah, no, I, I fully agree. But the, I, I do think 
that it, it should be one of our next big challenges to, to counter <laughs> this, this corporate capture which is going on both in the medical and in the non-medical uh, licit cannabis markets. Now, but at, at the moment, almost every week, there is somewhere an international business conference you know, with all guys in, in suits uh, talking about millions and billions and, and making prospects about how, how this market is growing, etc. Now, wh wh while with, within a few hundred meters from those conference places, the, the, there are still prisons filled with, with people you know, who, who have who are there for just possession of cannabis or 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 have been a small trader or no and, and there there is no connection between those two and and there there should be you know? the, the, those yeah the, 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 there has to be a, a social justice like fair trade principles for the the construction of this illicit market and um, and, and that requires, indeed, yeah, special provisions for the ones who have been involved in the illicit, who have been criminalized, who have been marginalized, and uh, both users, but also uh, small producers and small traders. Uh, th yeah, there have, there have to be ex expungement of criminal records, but I would say even preferential access schemes for them to, to become players in the licit market. No, be, be, before all these, the, 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 all the, the corporations just capture the, the, the complete market. And then, because I, I also, I, I am not at all against incremental steps. No? We are we're constantly working on improving policies also at national level and, and, and of course, Every step is, is, is not the, the one we had hoped it, it would be, and, but, but as long as there's progress, no, of course, it's, that is worth fighting for. But, but the worry I have now, seeing this, this corporate capture going on, and then at the UN level, well, get, getting these kinds of messages from both the WHO and the INCB, which, which are basically favoring the kind of products that, that uh, only the pharmaceutical industry can produce. And, and if that helps the pharmaceutical industry and, and the big cannabis um, uh, companies to fully capture basically the medical market, yeah, then they have such a, an advantage at the moment when it also rolls out further into the, the non-medical uh, and I see that as a serious risk, and I also think it is a responsibility for also the drug policy reform movement. Now, we've all fought for ending the criminalization of, of, of cannabis, of users, of farmers. But yeah, now that the wheels of change are turning, we also have to take the responsibility that this change has to happen in a social, socially just a responsible way. Yeah. Just say one more little thing. Excuse me? Can I add one more little thing? Of course. I just want to add, uh, it'd be horrible if I didn't, because this is now becoming my main thing that I'm working on, Appalachians of Origin Intellectual Property Rights. And I talked about craft farmers. So we're in the Mendocino Appalachians Project in California, we're working with the state legislature to create uh, origins uh, protection for cannabis. It's, it's some of the best cannabis in the world from California. If you'd like it to stay that way, it won't be if you grow it in a big shed owned by Marlboro or whatever in the valley. It's, it's up in the hills and these little farms and with the culture and the people. The, it, you know, we call it indigenous cultivation in other parts of the world. But that's what it is. It, it, and, and if you think about grandma's tomatoes, the heirloom tomatoes that taste better than any, and, and you can't even grow them at home even with her seeds. I mean, that's what we're looking for is something that's geographically uh, both sustainable but unique and, and very beautiful and worth saving and to create a path to market for that all the way to the international level it requires a whole new set of international bodies that I'm working with now and I'm just beginning to learn the WIPO, World International Property Organization, the World Trade Organization and working with the state legislatures and, and the farmers all the way up to the UN is like my dream job so I, I shout out to my friends out there in California and, and I think uh, it's not enough Certainly, to, to, to even if you scale it up around the world, but I think it's something that can help, uh, at least for some of the farmers that have identified themselves and that we can find, to, to help create some protections from the big industry and create some space uh, that, that will help to, 
like I said, again, make it both, both sustainable. From our perspective, you know, it's a beautiful thing that we're really trying to preserve and get from here to there again. This is a really interesting subject. We could sit here for hours and discuss it yeah, until sunrise. Um, uh, and I'm really happy that we have so smart and co uh, committed activists and professionals um, working on the future. Uh, thank you, uh, Michael, Lisa and Martin for being with us today. And thank you for those who are watching us online. Please follow us on uh, Facebook and Twitter to learn about our new uh, video shows. Bye.